Welcome everybody. This is the uh, fifth in our mass spectrometry training series. My name is Rod Chalk. Today we're going to be learning about principles of intact protein analysis. So what we'll do today is I'm going to spend some time just um, going over the advantages that intact protein analysis has over tandem MSMS. The last two um, presentations, or last three presentations have been tandem MSMS. Uh, this is the most widely used technique, um, but there are some significant advantages which we will cover. Uh, so we'll cover how it's done in terms of sample prep, in terms of ionization, and in terms of data analysis. We'll look at how we interpret intact mass spectra. Uh, we'll look at um, post-translation modifications, it'd be quite interesting, and then some of the applications we can use with the technique. So in essence, there are three experimental approaches to protein mass spectrometry. The first we've already covered, this is the bottom-up approach where peptides are generated using uh, a protease. Uh, they're separated by HPLC and then fragmented by MSMS. The key thing to understand about this technique is it generates uh, partial sequence data. So we can match it to, to our sequence via uh, homology. And we can also use it to locate post-translation modifications. And the analogy I would use is um, we can identify this as, as egg because it, that's what it tastes like. The second method which we'll cover today is top-down. And here proteins remain intact under denaturing conditions and we use accurate mass measurement in order to um, identify the protein by, to, by um, identity and to uh, identify any unknown post-translation modifications. So the analogy here is um, we know this is egg because it looks like an egg. We have some structural information which we didn't have before. And then finally, a third approach is native where proteins again remain untacked, but intact, but this time under native conditions and we can use accurate mass to identify structure, um, identity, post-translation modifications, also molecular interactions, and we can use the charge state distribution to get biophysical data. And we'll cover that uh, next week. So what are the limitations of tandem MSMS? So it is the most widely used technique for protein mass spectrometry. It is extremely sensitive. And very importantly, it handles complex samples, highly complex samples, extremely well. However, the sequence coverage is always incomplete. And it's very important to understand that because it has important implications. You are identi identifying protein by its homology to a database, but not its identity. And because of that, um, <clears throat> It's very poor at differentiating different taxonomic species or different protein constructs. Um, any homologs you have, if they have an identical mouse score, they are listed together at random by, by mascot. Um, intact proteins and partially degraded proteins, once you've uh, digested them with the protease, you can't differentiate between them. Also, uh, post-translation modifications cannot be differentiated. I've given, given you an example at the bottom. If this is our linear protein sequence, here we have an unmodified sequence. Here we have three successive post-translation modifications. If we now compare that with these three isoforms, which have the same modifications, but just not all three together, uh, these sets of data will appear absolutely identical following a protease digestion. So we can use accurate mass. We use accurate mass a lot in mass spectrometry for small molecule characterization, uh, where we can get a uh, mass accuracy of, of, of one part per million or, or more. Um, this, if, if, the, if, the, if the molecule is small enough, this allows us to determine a unique molecular formula. We can't achieve that degree of accuracy normally with intact proteins. More normally we would see uh, about 50 parts per million or less, um, but that is sufficient for us to identify the protein. That is 
that is its covalent structure. Um, so in the proteomics experiment, um, the theoretical masses are generally not known. However, in a recombinant protein experiment, we will always know what sequence we are looking for. So the theoretical mass is always known, and that is crucial to the method. So most labs will, as I said, will work on bottom-up uh, protein characterization. A few labs will work on top-down pr protein characterization. Um, and whichever technique they're using, they will basically say this is the only technique you need. You need. Um, that's not true. Um, if we make a comparison of the two techniques, so for bottom-up, we're using nanograms of protein. It's extremely sensitive. For um, top-down analysis, we need a lot more. We need maybe a thousand times more protein. But again, not very much. Instead of nanograms, micro micrograms are sufficient. We don't need to know the theoretical mass in a bottom-up experiment. However, for a top-down experiment, we do need to know that theoretical mass. Um, but for a, a recombinant protein uh, experiment, we will always know that. Um, Bottom up, I said, is very good for complex samples. For top down, ideally, we want the sample to be pure. We want a single species there. Bottom up, we, we identify by homology. Top down, we, we achieve identity. So the covalent structure from our bottom up experiment is not actually known, whereas we can determine the absolute covalent structure in a top down experiment. MSMS is quite slow. The slowest step in that is the, um, is the triptych digestion. Um, that's usually overnight, but also you may have quite a long um, LCMS run as well, maybe one or two hours. Um, top down, because we're not, we don't need to achieve anything in terms of separation, we can do that extremely fast. Um, so in our lab, we can do that in about 90 seconds. Bottom up allows you to, MSMS allows you to map post translation modifications. It does not necessarily allow you to map all of them. It will allow you to map some of them because you are not going to achieve complete peptide coverage. In top down, post translation modifications are sometimes mapped, um, usually if they're N terminal on the protein, which is very common, then we can usually determine that. Um, MSMS, we can only see the PTMs that we are expecting. Um, in top-down, every single PTM, you will observe it. If it's detectable, you will observe it. Um, so as I said, post translation ma mapping is incomplete in MSMS. In intact mass analysis, post-translation modifications can be quantified and all of them will be observed. So there isn't a best method. It depends what you are doing. If you are doing proteomics, you will almost certainly have to use MSMS. If you are working on one of any number of recombinant protein applications, um, intact mass analysis is far more suitable and far more informative. So let's take a look now at how we do it. Let's start with the sample preparation. You remember from the first um, presentation, this is our typical uh, mass spectrometry workflow, sample in into the mass spectrometer and beta analysis out. But before the sample can go in, we have to do some sample preparation and for intact mass analysis that would be reverse phase HPLC. So we're going to, we're going to um, uh, uh, load our protein onto the cartridge with uh, um, in, in the aqueous mobile phase and then we're going to elute it um, typically with methanol or with acetonitrile. In our lab we use an extremely short cartridge, it's not really a column. Uh, all we need to achieve is desalting. Because we have this small cartridge um, that generates a very low back pressure. That's advantageous because it means we can apply a very high flow rate at one mil per minute. And that means we can do our elution very quickly. Uh, that makes a difference if we're going to do high throughput analysis. And as I said, the elution is typically less than 90, is typically 90 seconds. 
there is, because it's reverse phase, there is a concentration effect. So we can take quite a large volume and then concentrate it onto the column. Um, we do this in the presence of 0.1% formic acid. Um, that's an iron pairing rage and it's also a denaturant. And what we achieve here is the proteins are desalted and denatured. That's what we need to achieve for uh, before it, it goes into the mass spec. So once the sample enters the mass spec, um, it undergoes ionization by uh, electrospray. Um, so the protein is already denatured. The ionization process will pro pro probably also denature it. So in electrospray, proteins are always multiply charged. That's very important, as you'll see in the next seminar. Um, and also, there are always multiple charge states. This means that we get multiple signals for each protein. Um, the higher charge states, they will predominate. High charge state means the M MZ is, is low, so it's the left-hand side of the spectrum. And that's advantageous because that's where the mass spectrometer performs the best. So if we have a high charge state, a low M to Z, that gives us maximum sensitivity on, on, in electrospray and also maximum mass accuracy. So I'll go into a little cartoon here. Um, this is our, uh, this represents our native folded protein. It has relatively few charges and this is high MZ. By denaturing it, we're unfolding that protein. Um, it's acquiring more charges, uh, more different, more charge states. And this low MZ will give us optimal performance for most mass specs. So let's look now at the data analysis. So this is a uh, typical data that you will see from uh, a short uh, intact mass run. Uh, it's important to appreciate that the, the LCMS data is in three dimensions. So you can't show this on, on the screen very easily. Um, the dimensions are iron intensity on the vertical axis versus retention time, which is on the horizontal axis. And the third dimension is mass to charge. So what you're seeing in this, um, in this uh, chromatogram here, this is iron intensity versus retention time. And this is referred to in mass spectrometry as the total iron chromatogram. And uh, an, a simple way to imagine this is it's very similar to a, uh, um, a UV chromatogram. Uh, basically, you have retention time on the bottom and you have peaks, and peaks correspond to the amount of stuff. However, we have the third dimension. The third dimension is, um, is MZ. And if you imagine that third dimension running into the screen, and so this is iron intensity on your vertical axis versus mass to charge. Remember, mass spectrometers don't measure mass, they measure mass to charge. And this is our spectrum. And those spectra are acquired several times a second as we move through the chromatogram, as I've illustrated here. So you can see what we need to do. In order to view that spectrum, we need to sum the spectra acquired over a period of time. And typically we would select a peak and sum the spectra over that peak. So here, um, this area that's, that's labeled in pink, uh, this is uh, that we will sum the spectra eluted between 0.8 and 1.2 minutes. And this is the result at the bottom. This is our MZ spectrum over this uh, retention time window. And what you see here is this is a characteristic protein multiple charge envelope. Okay, so this is a typical protein signal from an, an intact mass experiment. So as it says here, the, the spectra is summed over a given retention time window. And it's important to understand that this spectrum is the data. This is what the mass spectrometer has actually measured. Okay, now you can see there is a problem with that, and it's actually quite difficult to work out, well, what is it that you actually have? Um, but just, just 
just hold with this idea for a minute of this uh, charge envelope. This is what a protein looks like in electrospray. And the comparison we like to make is we describe this as a dinosaur's back. Okay, so similar to this. This is Dimetrodon. Uh, as my son would tell me, this is not actually a dinosaur, it's a theropod, but, um, but you get the idea. So we have the problem is one species in electrospray, if it's a protein, it will generate many peaks. And the, there is a simple solution to that. Um, the MZ values for um, the same species, they are all mathematically related because the mass, of course, is constant and Z is an integer. So all we need to do is solve the simultaneous equation for all the values of MZ and this allows us to determine M. It's not necessary for you to do this manually. Um, there is software that will do this for you. And this data transformation is called deconvolution. So when we have deconvoluted this summed spectrum, we now end up with what we describe as a deconvoluted spectrum or a neutral spectrum. So remember these peaks, these are the mass to charge intensities. This peak here is the transformed spectrum, the deconvoluted spectrum, and this here, if you can just read that, it's 39,038. This is the neutral mass. Um, just to confuse you, um, we still have multiple peaks. Uh, the reason we have those multiple peaks is Electrospray has a phenomenon with proteins uh, of uh, sodium adduction. So what happens is the, um, uh, the protons can be displaced by one, two, three, four sodium ions. So it's loss of a protein, sorry, loss of a proton, addition of a sodium, um, and so that, that is a mass shift of plus 22, and very typically you get this descending series of plus 22. That has no structural significance at all. That is just a phenomenon of the electrospray ionization of proteins. Uh, and it's actually quite useful, um, but just, just bear that in mind, you should expect to see sodium adducts. So this deconvolution process can be automated and we do that for high throughput. Um, very often, a mass spectrometry lab, if they're going to do this, they will only bother to show you this data. But please bear in mind, this data has been mathematically transformed. It is not normal data. And as you, you will see in the, in the next seminar, there is a huge amount of information in that raw data. So that's the basic process. Um, it's relatively simple, but there are some pitfalls. And one of the pitfalls I want to show you now. Okay, so when is a protein not a protein? So you can see, uh, this is the, uh, I think the same spectrum I showed you in the original slide, in, uh, in the original uh, slide. Um, here, the explanation of these multiple peaks is we have a single mass. Each mass has many different charge states and um, we have mz increments and these increments increase um, as we go up the mz scale so you can see that these peaks are close together as we move higher up the mz scale they become further and further apart and this pattern is indicative of a protein charge envelope that's totally normal if you now compare that with the spectrum underneath there is a crucial difference. Superficially, it looks the same, but it's different. And the difference is in the separation of these peaks. The MZ separation of these peaks is the same, okay? From here to here, there is no change. Uh, what you have here is you don't have one mass with multiple charge states. What you actually have is multiple masses that all have the same charge. So M is different, but Z is the same. What that means is these MZ increments are constant. 
And a spectrum like this indicate, indicates a polymer mass distribution, okay? It's important to know this. Um, this is in fact PEG, polyethylene glycol. Um, so PEG is completely inert. The only way you're going to see this is in a mass spectrometer. Um, unfortunately, polyethylene glycol is extremely common in biological preparations. It's the kind of thing that are, it's a stabilizer. It's the kind of thing that you might find in enzymes. It occurs in plastic where it's actually all over the lab. Um, you don't need to add it, very often it's there. Um, the reason you need to know about it is first, you don't want to confuse it with the protein because it isn't. If you attempt to deconvolute this spectrum, you will get nothing because the deconvolution is relying on this incremental mass separation, which does not exist here. The other reason you need to know about this is because polyethylene glycol and um, other synthetic polymers are very powerful ion suppressants. So it's quite likely that if you see this in your spectrum, you may well have protein present, but you will not see anything. It will, the, the, the polyethylene glycol will preferentially ionize um, over your protein signal. So it's very important to recognize that. I said that the MZ spectrum is the raw data and we have transformed that raw data. And during the process of that transformation, you can generate artifacts. You can generate deconvolution artifacts. And I've shown you a spectrum here. Um, this is the species that we, expe we are expecting, uh, 46,445. Um, we have other peaks in the spectrum. Uh, we have a peak which appears at exactly half the mass. We have another peak that appears at double the mass, treble the mass, and four times the mass. So this half mass is actually not possible. So you can you could ignore that. You know that that is not real. Um, it is possible to get dimers. Um, however, covalent dimers are extremely unlikely under the denaturing conditions that we use for um, intact mass analysis. So. How do we differentiate this apparent um, artifact um, from a real dimer? So what you need to do is you need to look at the sodium adduct. Remember I said sodium adduct is loss of a proton and addition of a, a sodium, so that's plus 22. So I've zoomed in on this spectrum here, on this, this peak, and I think you can't see that, you'll have to take my word for it, but that mass separation there is plus 22. And that's what you'd expect for a sodium addict. If you look at the apparent dimer, if we zoom in on, on that peak, it looks almost identical, except that that mass separation now is plus 44. And that isn't possible so that you know that this is a deconvolution artifact. Okay, so uh, that's something to bear in mind when you're, when you're doing protein deconvolution. So the program we normally use for, for protein deconvolution, the pro program called MAXENT, stands for maximum entropy, MAXENT3. It's extremely powerful. I think it's probably one of the best deconvolution programs um, just to give you an illustration of how powerful it is. Um, so this is a separation of a membrane protein. Um, this is the total ion chromatogram. This major peak here is actually non-protein. That's probably detergent. Uh, there's a second detergent peak here. And this very, very insignificant looking peak, if we sum the spectra together, we get this, this kind of untidy looking pump. Um, it looks like a whole load of noise. However, if you look carefully, you can see that there is some structure within it. If you use Maxent deconvolution to deconvolute that, that MZ spectrum, you will get a perfectly respectable neutral mass spectrum for the integral mem membrane protein. 
I just want to show you that just to, just to show just how powerful Maxent can be. It's extremely good at pulling out useful information from what appears to be very unacceptable data. So the other thing to appreciate about intact, intact mass spectra is they are information rich. They are extremely information rich. I want to just illustrate this with this spectrum. So this is a spectrum for a, a membrane protein. This is SLC1. And effectively, we have three peaks here. We have uh, this peak, uh, 14988. Uh, there is a sodium adduct. And then we have a second peak, which is a mass addition of 239 Daltons. So we this is the sequence. Um, we know the expected mass, this is with and without the tag, and um, it doesn't match. However, that's not a problem because we have a program that can uh, look for a sequence string within here whose expected mass corresponds to the mass that we've measured, um, and this is what it looks like. And so we actually are able to match that peak to the sequence. Um, we have loss of the N-terminal methionine. That's completely normal. That's what we would expect, loss of the N-terminal methionine. And we have a C-terminal truncation, which matches for the sequence, which matches our observed mass. We also have this mass addition of 239. If we look that up in Unimod, um, I don't know if you can see this, um, but this corresponds to PAR methylation. So PAR methylation is addition of uh, um, a, a, a hydrophobic group onto, um, usually onto a cysteine, and that is quite typical uh, for membrane proteins. So we know that we have PAR methylation there. So we can identify the construct. We know that our construct is pure, nothing else there. We know that it's N-terminally modified. We know that it's lost to methionine. We also know that it's C-terminally truncated and we know what that truncation is. We know that it's parmitylated because of the mass shift. Um, you may not have spotted it, but there isn't a perfect match. It's within the tolerance. The tolerance here is three Daltons. It's actually the, uh, the expected mass for this truncation and the observed mass is actually two Daltons lighter than expected. And the reason for that is within this sequence, there, are, there is a disulfide bond. So we know it has a disulfide bond. Um, parmethylation, as I said, that occurs on a cysteine. And so that we know that that parmethylation, because of the disulfide bond, that parmethylation must occur on the unpaired cysteine. From the intensity of this peak, we can calculate the parmethylation site occupancy, which is approximately 2%. And we can also conclude that there are no other post-translational modifications present. So all of this information you can obtain from a single and relatively simple intact mass spectrum. This is uh, typical of, of some of the analyses we do here at the CMD. Um, we do intact mass analysis from a test expression. So this is from a um, one mil test expression of this target. Um, here's our expected mass. Here's our measured mass. So it's within tolerance. So that allows us to establish it is the correct, it's the correct construct. So we know that we've got expression. We know the construct is correct. We know there are no mutations. Um, we have sodium adducts, they're expected. Um, we also have two further mass, mass additions, and these are post-translation modifications. So this one, uh, it's actually plus seven, 178. This is gluconylation and uh, plus two, Five eight, that is phosphogluconylation, and this modification is always associated with a polyhistidine tag. So our post-translation modifications have been localized, and 
this is very useful because it means we have no need to sequence this construct. We know its structure and we know it's correct. I want to show you another use now for um, intact mass analysis. So MTHFR is a metabolic enzyme. It has a, 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 a polysterine region, which is um, a control region, which is multiply phosphorylated. Um, so in the, if you measure the intact mass of this protein, this is, this is what you will see. Um, this corres corresponds to the expected mass with um, plus nine phosphorylations. This is the expected mass with plus eight. Um, if we phosphatase tr treat MTHFR, we get this spectrum at the bottom. So this is the unmodified mass. So this is phosphorylation state zero, P1, P2, P3, P4, and then we can see the others. There is no P5 or P6. There's 100% the occupancy. P8 and P9. Another thing we can do with intact mass analysis is we can look at glycosylation. Um, glycoproteins tend to be quite difficult to see by intact mass, and that's because they're usually quite large. And also, instead of one peak, you will get, as we do here, you will get maybe five, six, or seven peaks, which represent this glycan envelope. If we have seven peaks, the signal to noise is a seventh of what we would see if there was a single species. So you tend to, you, you, in order to see these, you need rather a lot of protein. It needs to be quite pure. The best way to uh, uh, analyze glycoproteins is to compare the um, untreated protein with a, a, a glycosidase treated protein. So this has been treated with endo F. Uh, here it's been treated, I think it's a mixture of endo F and PNGAs F. So that's endo H and PNGAs F. So when we have this sequence, we can see the different phosphorylation states. So this is the um, unmodified protein. Uh, this is G1, G2, uh, so it's G2, G3, G4, G5, G6. That's G8 and this is glycosylation state nine. So quite a heavily glycosylated protein. And we can also match, um, we can match, uh, we can work out what the core glycan is. Um, so you can get a lot of information from uh, looking at different uh, glycosylation states of a glycoprotein by intact mass. Um, this is uh, another Another integral membrane protein, this is KCNK10. Um, the expected mass of KCNK10 is 31,000. Um, and this is the spectrum we got from the intact mass analysis. And you can see that nothing here matches the expected mass. The reason for that is because uh, KCNK10, rather unusually, this is a covalent dimer. So there's a single disulfide bond. Um, and, and this is this, so it retains dimer structure in, in denaturing LCMS. And the dimer corresponds to this mass here. But we have a whole load of other things going on in this spectrum. It's actually a very uh, complex spectrum, rather difficult to interpret. Um, this area here, these mass shifts correspond to 162, which would be a hexose which indicates this, this is probably glycosylation. And the solution to this structure basically looks like this. So because we have a, a, a dimer, we have two N-termini on that dimer, and these peaks represent uh, uh, lot mass losses at one or other of, so it's either at one or both of these termini. Okay, so <coughs> KCNK10 in this condition, it's a covalent dimer. It has seven different isoforms, and for each of the seven isoforms, there are there are 21 glycoforms. Okay, so you can get a huge amount of information from this intact mass spectrum. Um, 
Here's a different protein. This is the developmental regulator, um, Sonic Hedgehog. Um, Sonic Hedgehog is extremely unusual in that it has, there is a post-translation modification. This is it. It is, uh, um, it, it is cholesterol esterification. Um, Sonic Hedgehog is the only protein known that has this modification. So at the uh, C terminus, uh, there is a cholesterol ester. And um, this can only be seen by intact mass. Nobody has been able to isolate this by MSMS. Um, so here you can see it, that this is, this is the full length protein. This is a truncated form. And that mass shift of 368, this corresponds to the N, the C terminal cholesterol ester. However, Sonic Hedgehog, it turns out, Sonic Hedgehog is also modified at the N terminus. If you look for the unmodified mass, for the unmodified mass of this construct was uh, 19,560, you can see that there is nothing. There is nothing in the spectrum corresponding to the unmodified mass, but we have this rather complex spectrum with one, two, three, four, five different species. If you measure those mass shifts from the expected mass, you see plus 29, this corresponds to S nitrosylation, plus 70 corresponding to pyruvic acid, um, plus here, plus 119, this is cystinylation, so this is uh, a second cysteine onto a cysteine. Um, this 305 mass shift is glutathione, and this is FMN. Um, we know that these modifications must be occurring at the N terminus. If we reduce sonic hedgehog, so we, we basically derivatize it with, um, we, we reduce the disulfide bonds and uh, derivatize it with iodoacetamide, um, this complex species, uh, spectrum is reduced down to two peaks. And this peak here corresponds to the unmodified mass uh, with two additions of the alkylating agent. And this is the unmodified mass with three additions. So this tells us, so, so Sonic Hedgehog has, again has one internal disulfide bond. And these modifications are all cysteine specific so that we know that these modifications occur at the end terminus. And that analysis can only be done by uh, intact mass. Um, quite a few labs have tried to do this by uh, MSMS. Uh, we tried to do it by MSMS. Uh, this is what we got in the first attempt. Um, you can see we have not got coverage of the C terminus, of the N terminus or the C terminus. Um, we tried the chymotrypsin, similar problem, no coverage at the N terminus or C terminus. Um, even when you know what you're looking for, so we knew these modifications were there, um, so we programmed those into mascot, still we cannot locate them by MSMS. Um, and then we realized, oh, actually, um, we must not reduce um, the protein. So this is this is the, the same analysis without the addition of dithiothrene at all. So we're not reducing these modifications on the cysteine. Still, we can't see any N-terminal or C-terminal um, uh, modifications. Um, uh, this is extended digestion. Again, we still couldn't see them. Uh, finally, we managed to get some coverage of the C-terminus. But the only reason we were able to do that is because one of the lysines was mutated, and that allowed us to cover to get this C terminal region. But C terminal sequencing and N terminal sequencing by MSMS is notoriously difficult, and no lab, including our own, have been able to do this by MSMS. So this is an example where you can only do your analysis by intact mass. Um, here's another analysis I want to show. Show you. So this is a protein called uh, Q-concat. It's it's a synthetic protein. It's um, 
is basically it's used for quantitative proteomics. It's a series of uh, peptides that have been uh, artificially linked together into a single construct. And what you want with this method is you want to have a, a reference peptides um, for quantitation that are um, uh, have a heavy label. So the way to do that is to incubate um, with, is to grow in the presence of nitrogen 15. So this is heavy nitrogen and um, this is the resulting spectrum. Um, this map, so, so if we compare this now to the same protein grown without the N15. And this corresponds to the expected mass and we have a mass difference here. Um, we can work out the composition of the sequence. Uh, we do that here, and you can see from the composition that there are 420 nitrogens in that sequence. If we subtract these two values for the mass, we get this mass, mass difference of 416, and if you just simply do the maths, it works out at a nitrogen 15 incorporation of 99%. Very, very simple calculation to do, very simple, very fast experiment to do. Uh, you can do this kind of thing by MSMS, but it's not gonna work anything like as well, and it's gonna be uh, much more time consuming. So we can use uh, intact mass analysis uh, for uh, high throughput analysis. So here at CMD, we do a lot of high throughput test expression. And as part of that, we can analyze it by intact mass. So this is an example of a 96 well uh, high throughput test expression, one mil test expression. And these are the constructs. Uh, this is our um, yield estimate from STS page, so high is in green, medium is in orange, and low yield is in yellow. And this is the expected mass for these constructs. These are the observed masses, and these are the mass differences. Uh, here's a comparison with uh, the gel data. So this is the gel for the first of these four samples. So what information do we get from this? Well, we get quite a lot. First, we can see that the observed mass matches the expected construct mass, so we know we've got the right construct. Um, we can uh, measure the intensity of the peaks and we can uh, get some uh, quantitation of the level of expression. Um, we have post-translational modification information for these constructs. Um, here's some more, these are phosphorylated. And you can see that there is a, a correlation between the length of these constructs um, their size and the number of phosphorylations that you have. So you can probably work out where some of these phosphorylations are occurring. And so this tells us for this, this test expression, it tells us whether or not the construct protein is expressed, it tells us if it's correct. We know there are no mutations. Uh, if there's any PTMs, we know what they are. We don't need any additional protein for this. And uh, for us, this does not represent any additional cost. And that's important because uh, it means we don't need to sequence the DNA, bearing in mind that that's gonna cost us um, four pounds per construct. So here's an example of, I don't want you to go away thinking that uh, intact mass is superior to MSMS. The two techniques are entirely complementary. In our lab, we use both of them. Um, and they yield different information. And ideally, um, they are complementary to each other. And here's a lovely example of where we can see this. So this is a kinase, SMAD1. Uh, here's the intact mass spectrum. So we have the phosphorylation state zero, P1, which is the predominant state, and P2. Um, so we know how many phosphorylation states there are, and we know their relative intensity, but we don't know where they are. To do that, we need to do uh, MSMS analysis, and we've mapped those two phosphorylations to these two N C-terminal series. So 
this data here, the MSMS data, is validated by the intact mass data. So it's, they're in agreement with it. So this is what we like to see. So we can map our post-translation modifications by MSMS, and then we can validate them and also quantify them by intact mass. This is a very nice example of how intact mass analysis and MSMS analysis can be complementary. So I'm going to I'm going to summarise now just to wind up. Um, so hopefully you understand that covalent structure it cannot be determined by MSMS. You must do intact mass analysis. If you want to do intact mass analysis, it's very fast. It's very robust. It's also amenable to open access. Um, in the CMD, uh, without the benefit of lockdown, um, we would normally train people to do this by themselves. Um, there are no expensive reagents needed, um, so it's very cheap. Um, it's ideally suited to recombinant proteins. The sample preparation, this is very quick. This is by a rapid reverse phase HPLC. Denaturation in uh, intact mass analysis is actually beneficial. This gives you a better signal. We've looked at data analysis. Um, this is usually completely straightforward, but you need to be aware of some of the pitfalls, and I've shown you two of these. These are, are polymers and also deconvolution artifacts. I hope you've come away with the, um, with the impression that the spectra you get are information rich. Um, there's a lot of information you can get from intact mass spectra if you know how to do it. Um, and basically it allows us rapid characterization and quantification of post-translation modifications. We can do this very, very quickly. And we can characterize PTMs which are difficult or impossible to characterize by MSMS. As I've said, the technique is amenable to high throughput and intact mass is complementary to tandem MSMS. So that's all I want to say. Um, next week we will be covering theory and practice of native mass spectrometry. Just to say something about that. So native mass spec involves measurement um, of both solution phase molecular interactions and multiple time resolved biophysical parameters. You can do this in a single experiment and this makes native mass spec uh, the most powerful benchtop analytical technique that's available to you. And so that's next week. And um, I'll be very happy to answer your questions. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Okay, so we have a question. How much info, info can MSMS data give you on post translation, uh, yeah, on PTMs to direct you towards the right intact mass spectrums, i.e., which proteins are interesting to study which modifications? Hmm. I would say that the, I mean, most of the data I've shown you is from um, uh, protein expression. Um, so I'm not sure I understand your question. Um, how much information can it give you towards the right intact mass experiments? I would say you should be doing, I mean, how we, how we do this is intact mass experiment because it's very quick. And it, if, it, if it's successful, it generates a huge amount of information that we, we kind of triage our analyses. So intact mass is always done first. Um, if we get interesting results, then we want to map those PTMs, then we would do MSMS. I'm not sure I would do it the other way around. Does that answer your question? Yeah, okay. Uh, second question. How do the sample, how pure do the samples have to be? Do people use it for endogenous levels of proteins or because the amount needed is limited to overexpression of recombinant proteins? Okay, that's a very good question. Um, it doesn't have to be pure. Um, what I would say is um, we would like to see that, let's say, 90% of the protein is a single species. Um, if you have other proteins present, this makes interpreting the data much more difficult. 
I mean, for example, in, in, the, in the example I showed you of, of the truncated membrane protein, uh, we have to assume that that's the only protein present and, and we get a match. If there are other proteins present that are unknown, um, then interpretation then becomes much more difficult. Um, so do people use it for endogenous levels of protein? Um, I would say in general, no, they don't. Um, there are two problems with working with endogenous proteins. The first one is it's usually very, very difficult to get them pure. When we're doing protein expression, we're using affinity purification, usually um, a, 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 a nickel purification or, or some other affinity tag. And so our, our purity is very high. Um, it's much harder to do that with endogenous proteins um, unless you're choosing a source which is, which is already enriched for that protein. The, another problem with endogenous proteins is they, they will be modified, but in general, you will not know what that modification is. Um, we have worked on endogenous proteins. It's very difficult to work out exactly what you have because you have these unknown PTMs. Um, so I would say the technique is, is, is limited really to recombinant protein analysis. Do we have any more questions? Apparently not. Okay, um, thank you very much. I hope you found that useful and I hope you join me next week. <laughs>